welcome you to our service today, and we're glad that you've taken the time to join us. Today we began the season of Advent, the new year of the church, and the season that we prepare for the return of our Lord. Our scripture today comes from Matthew, the 24th chapter, verse 36 through 44, and speaks of the Lord's return. But of that day, no one knows the hour, not even the angels of heaven, but only my Father. But as the days of Noah, so there will be the coming of the Son of Man. For in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came, and took them all away, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken, the other will be left. Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore also, be ready, for the Son of Man is coming in an hour when you do not expect. May God add his blessing to his holy word. Our Lord tells us that the date that he will return is not known to anyone but the Father. Many years have passed and many people have guessed a date and were just sure that it was going to come. And it passed and they looked foolish. Jesus made it clear that only the Heavenly Father knew that date. And while at least he was on this earth, he did not even know the date that he would return. So no person on this earth will be able to tell you when the Lord will return. Jesus does tell us this. On the day that he does return, this world will be functioning just as it was in the day of Noah. We'll be eating and drinking. They'll be getting married. They'll be looking for life to be a party. But if you read the sixth chapter of Genesis, it tells us that the days of Noah were marked by violence. Men were evil and there was demonic oppression. It tells us that even though mankind knew that what they were doing was against the will of God, they didn't care, they did it anyway. They continued in their ways and ignored the warnings of God. They lived as if there would be no day of judgment, no day of reckoning. And then the flood came. And those who ignored the warnings, it came suddenly and quickly and unexpectedly and did them in. We live in a world that goes on with a business as usual attitude. We ignore things that we used to call wrong. We as a country worry more about our rights than we do about our responsibilities. We hear the warnings that Jesus gave to us about wars and rumors of war, changes in the weather, earthquakes, famines and pestilence, as well as a decline of morality. And we ignore this as a sign of the coming of the Lord. Understand that's a mighty cavalier attitude when you think about what the Lord said would happen after he raptured his people home. In the fifth chapter of 1 Thessalonians, the apostle Paul writes, for you yourselves know that the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then suddenly destruction comes upon them as labor pains among a pregnant woman. Let me tell you just a part of what the Bible says will happen. When the tribulation comes, a quarter of the earth's population will die from war and starvation. Giant earthquakes accompanied by thunder and lightning will happen. A massive meteor shower will hit the earth. Ashes and smoke rising from its devastation will hide the sun and the moon. Rampant epidemic plagues will kill one third of all mankind. The pandemic that we just faced is a glimpse of what is to come. There will be more along with other plagues that the Bible speaks about. 
And then Jesus talks about what happens when the rapture occurs. He says, two men will be in the field. One will be taken, one will be left behind. Two women are grinding at the mill. One will be taken, the other will be left behind. Life will be going on as it always has happened, but then there will be a change. The ones who have made Jesus Christ Lord of their life will be called up to be with him in heaven. And those who have rejected Jesus, as well as those who have just neglected to decide what they're going to do about him, will be left here. The sad truth is there's good people who are going to be left behind to face the horrors of the things that are to come. They've gone about their business, living their life. They took care of the things that they believed to be important to them. But they didn't do anything at all about the most important decision that they would ever make. Jesus speaks to us about being ready for that day. He says, watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. Then he gives to us a word of warning. He says, but know this, if the master of the house had known what hour the thief was coming, he would have taken care of his business and not been broken into. Therefore be ready for the Son of Man is coming and you do not know when to expect him. It could be today. It could be at any hour that the Lord returns. Are you ready? Are you ready for his return? Are you looking forward to it? If to this was the hour that the Lord chose to come back, are you prepared? Or are there things that you have left undone? people that you haven't spoken to? Are there those who will remain here who you wish were going home with you? Are you praying for them? Are you witnessing to them? Have you invited them to church? Does it even matter to you? Have you ever thought about it? Those who are left behind are going to be in a terrible situation. And it could be people we love. Second Peter, the third chapter, verses 11 and 12, tells us as Christians what we should be doing. It says, you should live holy lives and serve God as you wait and look forward to the coming of the day of the Lord. We aren't just to be looking. We're to be preparing. We're to be coming ready. And most of us aren't. The time and date of the Lord's return is unknown. But the fact that he will return, that he will come back for his own is certain. And he will come for his own. And he has told us that he will. And he has told us what the state of the world will be like when he comes. Look around you and see what doesn't match what the Lord said things would be like. There are wars possibility of even more wars could occur. We've seen droughts that brought on famines in many countries. Violence and crime is rampant in our country in a way we've never seen it before. Morality is slipping in this world. Yet the return of the Lord doesn't appear to be on the mind of many people. And he told us that it wouldn't be. For the church, we wait on the Lord's return. And maybe we've simply become too good at waiting. We've lost the call to be prepared for the Lord's return. We aren't looking for his return. We're satisfied with this world we live in. And we simply hope that it's gonna to continue to get better for us. We don't look up and ask, today, Lord, is today that you come for us? Is today the day that you call us home? We're too busy to allow the Holy Spirit to give us a vision of heaven and what it might be like and the hope that we have there. We look at what we've got to do this week and how busy we are and how are we going to get everything done. We act and feel like we're going to be here forever when the scripture tells us absolutely that we won't be. 
and we wouldn't want to be. Because when the Lord takes his own home, the tribulation will be very unpleasant. This world is not our home and everything in it is not ours. One day we will leave it all behind. We have been redeemed for a better world beyond what we can imagine. We think of the one who paid our price and understand his faithfulness to us, so much so that he warned us that a day was coming when he would return and what things would be like on that day. And then what would happen after we were taken home. He gave his life for us. He sacrificed for us because he loves us so much that he would not have us go through that. I'll tell you this story. A century ago in the Virginia mountains, there was a community school. Most of the children who attended that school had parents who were either in the mining business or in the logging business. It was a hard way of life. The school had children of all grades and the boys that were there were tough and they were mean spirited. No teacher had lasted more than two months at the most, some lasting only a few days. After the last one left, an application came from a young man who had just gotten out of college. The superintendent of the school called him and he said, I don't really want to see you take this job. He told him what the school was and how tough it was and how many teachers had left. And he said, this is not where you want to start your career. But Mr. Wilson told him, he said, I need the money and I believe I can help these children. I want to be their teacher. So he hired him. On the first day there, he saw the boys in the back of the class talking and he knew what was going on. Big Tom, the school bully, was there and he said, well, when I'm done with him, he won't set foot in this school again. And the others just sort of laughed and joined in with him. But Mr. Wilson called everyone and told them to sit down and begin the class. And he began with that class with saying, I'm your new teacher. And I can't teach this class without order and without rules. So I want each of you to have a part in making the rules for the class class had never been asked to participate in the rules before, so Big Tom didn't know what to make of it. He decided he'd wait and see how this turned out before he began to harass Mr. Wilson. First student said, no stealing, that should be our rule. So Mr. Wilson wrote it on the blackboard. No being late, another cried out, and he wrote that on the board. No lying, another said. And then he stopped at 10 rules and he said, I think we have enough to work by. Does everybody agree to the rules? So everyone did. They laughed and they snickered, but they agreed that that should be the rules. Okay, Mr. Wilson said, rules can't be enforced unless there's a penalty for breaking them. What penalty comes when you break a rule? And Big Tom spoke up and he said, Whoever breaks a rule gets 10 licks on a bare back. That should be the rule. Mr. Wilson thought the penalty was a little harsh, but nobody dared agree with Big Tom. And since he'd allowed them to make the rules, he had to allow them to make the punishment as well. Tom being a part of the process satisfied him that day, and it didn't cause Mr. Problem, Mr. Wilson any problems for the rest of that day. And things went smooth the next morning all the way up until the noon bell rang when it was time for lunch. And Big Tom's voice boomed, somebody stole my lunch. And Mr. Wilson said, everyone stay in your seats. No one's gonna eat until we find out who stole Big Tom's lunch. No one admitted to taking the lunch. And then finally a little 10 year old boy stepped up and he said, it was me. He was wearing an old coat that was too big for him. He said, I done it, it was me. I was so hungry I couldn't help myself. Mr. Wilson's heart sank. Jimmy, 
take off your coat, I have to give you 10 licks across the back. Jimmy begged him, he said, Mr. Wilson, you do whatever you have to do, but please don't make me take my coat off. He said, Jimmy, you know the rules. We made them yesterday. I have to give you 10 licks, take your coat off. Slowly, he took his coat off. He had no shirt on. He only had suspenders holding up his pants. Mr. Wilson had a dilemma. He said, how in the world could I whip this poor child? But if I don't, I'll lose control of the class. So he stalled a minute. He said, Jimmy, why didn't you wear a shirt today? Jimmy looked at him and he said, well, we've been real poor since my dad died in the mind. And I've only got one shirt and today's wash day. So I have to wear my brother's coat, but I'll get my shirt back tomorrow. It was all he could do to pick up the paddle. Jimmy's back was scrawny. He was little. He turned his back to the class. And about that time, Mr. Wilson drew the paddle back and he could hear every child in that class was starting to cry. And suddenly Big Tom yelled out, don't do it. I want to take Jimmy's licks for him. So the teacher nodded and he handed Jimmy his coat back. And Big Tom came up, taking off his shirt and he stood there and he took his punishment. And Jimmy ran up after it was done and he hugged Big Tom. And he said, Tom, I'll love you forever for taking my licking for me. I'm so sorry I ate your lunch. I wish I hadn't. We have a savior who took our licking. And it was far worse than whips on the back. Although he took that too. For he knew what was to come for those who would not come to him. And he didn't want any that he loved to face that punishment. We have been spared that. We have a Savior who took our punishment. A Savior who knows you by your name and who loves you. And he has no plans to see you lost to the punishment that will come to those who reject him. Watch. Be ready. He will come to take you home. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this blessing you have given us of coming to you, of being your people, Lord, loved by you, cared for, of being given eternal life, of having our sins forgiven as if we had never done them and being washed clean in your blood. Lord, lead us to watch. Lead us to be ready. Lead us to share the good news of the hope of salvation forever with all those we need to share it with so many in this world. For Lord, you will return. You will call your own home. May we be a part of that number. This we pray. Amen.